Good afternoon. Good afternoon and welcome to this book talk. We're going to wait just a minute uh, before starting to let people trickle into the Zoom session, but thank you for joining us. Welcome, welcome. Thank you for joining us. We'll start in just a few. Alrighty, welcome. Thank you for joining us this afternoon. I'm Shawnee Yvette Moraine, Director of Community Engagement for the Digital Public Library of America, which is a national platform providing free access to digitized collections from 4,000 libraries, archives, and historical societies and museums across the country. DPLA amplifies the value of libraries and cultural organizations as America's most trusted sources of shared knowledge. I am so excited to welcome you all to DPLA's second book talk, which will feature a conversation between Chanda Prescott Weinstein, author of The Disordered Cosmos, A Journey into Dark Matter, Space, Time, and Dreams Deferred, and Lori Harris, Assistant Dean and Director of the Donald C. Harrison Health Sciences Library and Henry R. Winkler Center at the University of Cincinnati. To ensure this book talk is truly inclusive and accessible to all, we're using CART to provide real-time captioning of the presentation via stream text. Please look at the chat for um, a link to access stream. To turn on closed captioning with Zoom, click the CC button at the bottom of your Zoom window. Also, please direct any questions to our featured author to the Q&A box accessible at the bottom of your screen. We will monitor the chat throughout and she will answer questions at the end. In the Disordered Cosmos, published in March 2021, Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein shares her love for physics from the standard model of particle physics and what lies beyond it, to the physics of melanin and skin, to the latest theories of dark matter, all with a new spin informed by history, politics, and the wisdom of Star Trek. One of the leading physicists of her generation, Dr. Chanda Prescott Weinstein is also one of fewer than 100 Black American women to earn a PhD from a department of physics. Her vision of the cosmos is vibrant, buoyantly non-traditional, and grounded in Black feminist traditions. It is an incredible honor to welcome new voices to the DPLA community and create a space for two dynamic Black women in the sciences to be in dialogue and dive deeper into Dr. Prescott Weinstein's bold new approach to science and society, beginning with the belief that we all have a fundamental right to know and love the night sky. Lori, take it away. Thank you, Shanae, and thank you everyone for coming today. Um, good afternoon, and thank you, Dr. Prescott Weinstein, for being with us today to talk about your new book. We're very excited. Um, I wanted to begin by just checking in with you. Um, since last year, I, I keep thinking what jumps in my head is the chaos theory, right? Applying it to what many of us have been sort of watching and experiencing, um, and on some levels, um, attempting to forget uh, the last several months. So wanted to hear how this last year has been for you, and how has it um, impacted your year and informed your work and the publication of The Disorder of Cosmos? Well, first of all, I just want to start by saying thank you and uh, everyone at the Digital Public Library of America for who was involved in organizing this and thank you for hosting and thank you, Lori, so much for, for being in conversation with me. Um, as, as you probably know, because you, you've read the book, I have some really lovely words for librarians and archivists at the end. Um, so I'm a big fan. <laughs> uh, 
you know, definitely there are like stages of grief. And I think we've all been going through like multiple versions of stages of grief. So I think I'll start with the, the last part of the question specifically about the book. When you're writing a book like this, you're spending a lot of time thinking about the audience and you're thinking about the conversations that you're going to have with people about the book and assume that those conversations are going to be happening in person, that you're going to be in physical rooms with people doing readings, going a book tour, that kind of thing. And so one of the, the versions of grief that I had to go through um, in the fall was accepting the fact that I wouldn't actually have that experience and that it was actually going to be much more of an uphill battle to get the word out about the book. Um, and that also as a result of the way that um, book events online work, that actually initially I did fewer bookstore events than like initially we were really, I was told plan three, eventually I pushed really hard and got five. And so I had all of these things in mind about even like black bookstores that I was going to visit that I am um, like SO one books in my hometown of Los Angeles. And um, the, the owner, James, is a friend with my mother and they do events together because of my mom's radio show. And so I was really excited to go to SO one and to not do that was actually a really big deal. Um, and in, then in some ways you're like going through that and you're like, but I have my health. And my most immediate family members have survived this pandemic. And so there's this weird um, things you feel grief about, but they also feel small compared to the other things you feel grief about. And I think that we've all had our version of living through both of those dynamics. Uh, there are things that were disappointing in our personal lives, but if we lived, um, if we didn't get sick, like I didn't get sick and I was in a position to really maximally protect myself, which so many other people were not. And I was aware the entire time that actually, like I lived the pandemic pretty well relative to a lot of people. And so all of that awareness, it's like a lot. And so I, I wanna acknowledge like for all of us that we're processing a lot of information and way more feelings than we're even used to processing. And we're not even good maybe on a normal day in a normal year at this. I do also want to say that um, this week, I think for those of us who are genderqueer, non-binary, or trans, that um, the, the last 24 hours have pro probably been particularly difficult for people, given the letter that Chimamanda Adichie put out. And so I'm actually having a, a tough time with that. I was posting about it on Facebook. I've been having arguments with like cis Black women that I really admire about it. So I just also want to acknowledge that that's something that's happening this week. <laughs> Yeah, so um, thank you for, for sharing that. I really like the way that you phrased um, the versions of, of grief, right? Because there are different layers and different um, experiences and different ways in which people respond. And then just as you intimated, there are so many other outside things going on that you know you have to integrate or sit with. Um, when you're just trying to do your own sort of grief. So thank you for, for sharing that. Um, I, I, I was really delighted when I read how you take seriously um, that information should not only be collected and used for um, explaining the why and how that the world is organized. This immediately made me think, you know, wow, this is, this is what librarians do, right? As librarians, we tap into so many different audi audiences in academia, public, private. Um, we deal with researchers, scholars, students. So who was the audience you wanted to reach with the disordered cosmos? And I see you kind of smiling, so. I'm, I'm smiling partly because I'm, one of the things that I've learned from reviews, and I will say actually that I don't read a lot of the reviews, but my spouse does, he reads all of them. Mm -hmm. um, and then occasionally says, okay, you can read this one. <laughs> but one of the things that I've learned is that reviewers often imagine an audience, like a single audience. I am like, there was a recent review that said physicists were the audience for the book, which I thought was like a, a, a very interesting claim. Um, at the end of the day, I think that the audience that mattered the most to me was um, Black people and Indigenous people and Black women and non-binary people in particular and Two-Spirit folk and, and Indigenous queer folk. Um, I think partly because 
when people imagine who science writing is for and who science books are for, we are the audiences that people are least likely to think about. And so that was the audience that I tried to think the most about. Um, and it was the audience, and, and, and then I'll say like broadening out the umbrella more broadly, I wanted to write to audiences who think that science writing isn't for them or who have been told implicitly or explicitly that science writing isn't for them. So I wanted to write a book for people who were like, maybe science, I, I like science, I think, but I'm, science isn't for me. And, and, and that's kind of a reflection of the conversations that I would have with folks. People would be like, oh yeah, tell me about quantum mechanics or like, tell me about like particle physics. Or I saw this thing the other day about like the stars. Um, this narrative that we have in society that black people need to get, be gotten interested in science Mm -hmm. as if we are not already is, is, is garbage. Right. And, and so, but at the same time, I, as I write about in the book, there's an idea in science writing of what the voice is supposed to sound like. And that's based on who they think the audience is. So I think at the end of the day, the book is for everyone, but there were definitely audiences that I specifically had in mind. Um, and I just want to thank you for uh, uh, being very candid and honest about that audience, because it's not very often that people will step up and say, this is for my Black people. This is for my queer folk. This is so thank you. Thank you for that, um, that honesty. Um, you, you mentioned properly citing um, like hidden references by saying their or her names and um, the unsighted labor and lack of acknowledgement of researchers and women, uh, those who, who are referencing the work and those who are citing the work. And, and those comments sort of intersected with your comments about Isaac Newton, the Isaac Newtons of the world, right? Who may be good at physics, but really are pretty crappy, not good human beings. So um, in your time in academia, have you seen any improvement on this phenomenon of sort of the hidden references? Um, and, and how do you and other researchers and women sort of challenge this, this paradigm while working within the confines of the academy? So an archival project that I'm working on right now, I have uh, two research assistants who are working with me. One of them is funded by the FQXI Foundation, I should say, um, is the Site Black Women Plus in Physics project. And so what we're doing right now is we are going through all of the Black women and non-binary people who have earned PhDs in physics in the United States. And we are compiling a bibliography of all of their papers, all of their publications. Um, and the plan is to make this publicly available. And the reason that I'm doing this is that this is very much inspired by the site Black Women Collective, which was founded by Kristen Smith um, at, at UT Austin. And the, the reason that I wanted to do this is that there's lots, there's, I shouldn't say lots maybe, but there's increasing uh, discussion and discourse about the importance of citing Black women. I didn't see that happening in the sciences really. And I think that often scientists think, well, yeah, but that's not like how science happens. Um, and so I wanted to put this resource together and I think that it will function in a few different ways, but part of it is intended to foment exactly that discussion that you're talking about, mm -hmm. um, which is like, hey, there are sometimes points where you're you know, at a position where you're like, you know what, I think I wanna move in a different direction with my research, what direction should I go in? So why not look at the site Black Women Plus list and see what Black women were working on and think about whether you can build on some research there so that you can cite those papers. That's a perfectly reasonable way to pick a new direction. It's just as reasonable as anything else, right? So I, I think that that's, that's one really simple way that, that people can, can tackle it. Um, I, I am increasingly seeing people in my specific field of um, dark matter research, um, who I think are consciously making an effort to include me more and make sure that I get cited more. Mm -hmm. I still feel like it's a pretty local thing. There isn't really a broad thing. And I will say that I, I don't particularly see women being better about this than men in, in the physics and astronomy communities at, the, at this point in time. 
Um, and I think part of that is there's a selection effect. Those of us who get as far as I have, say, um, and you know, get to faculty position, it's often because we've learned to play like the boys. And I will say that I fall into that category. I know how to play that game. I'm, I've also you know, made a lot of noise about how the game is broken and how we shouldn't be playing this game. But some people just survive because they learn how to play the game and that's just what they do and that's how they build their career, right? And so there's a selection effect that the women who are here are likely the women who can go along to get along and are, who are willing to do that. And can you keep us surprised when that site list is, is gonna be ready? Um, yes. I mean, I would, I would, I would love, in, in particular for for you, Lori, as someone who's like a a, a science li librarian, <laughs> I would love to get feedback also from from people once once we start to put it together about like you know here's a format. Um, at this point, they're literally just collecting things in Zotero. Yeah. And what's really been interesting about it is, um, the the RAs neither of them has a physics background. And um, we've had some, some really interesting conversations, but um, they have just spent literally the last week. Um, there's, there's one black woman physicist who works on a project at the Large Hadron Collider. And so she works on one of these like really big experiments where there are like a thousand authors on every paper and every single paper, no matter who was really responsible for it, <clears throat> pardon me, has like all of the co-authors on it. And so they literally just put a few thousand papers for, um, for uh, Ayana Arce in it. So it, I, I, I want to like articulate for people so that folks understand that this is not simple work and that this is not easy work. And the work of, that archivists do, as you know, requires like a real attention to detail. And, and a real care also for, for your subject, which I'm um, really thinking about. Um, these, these two RAs, they're both wonderful, have been like looking up the women, learning about them and um, thinking and bringing to me like, oh, you know, I noticed that a lot of the women don't have very many papers and having to have the conversation also about the feelings that come up, having that kind of contact with the archive and the story that comes out from just looking at the level of someone's presence in the archive. Yeah, that's that's so exciting. I'm sort of that's my second career. I started off in archives, so shout out to your archivists. That that those are my people. So I'll just say that. Um, I think one of the things that really uh, resonated with me in your book is how forthright you are about what what we don't know. So for me, hearing terms like quantum physics, dark matter. Quarks, it has made me think, you know, our scientists and researchers, they have this cosmos thing down. But then as I read a little further, you share very matter of factly that um, the evidence of dark matter serves as a reminder, like, hey, folks, you don't, you know, we don't really know everything about the universe. Um, and, and models that we use, such as the standard uh, mode of particle physics, it doesn't make sense of everything. How do we how do we come to terms with that tension of hey, we know some things and are speculating on others? Um, there's just and I'll admit I was a little terrified. Like wait, we don't we don't know everything. So how do we sit with that tension? Mm. I remember the first time I got confronted really um, with with a version of this question in, in a very public way. I was being interviewed by Nam Kiwanuka for, for TVO um, in Ontario. And Nam said, okay, so if you're saying that we, we don't know everything, then what do we say to people who don't believe that global warming is happening? Right. And so I think like the important thing is, is to be clear that there are actually a lot of things that we do know. <laughs> And that, I've, that there, there are some lucky, I guess I'll put lucky in air quotes, there are some instances where the data is very clear. And so for example, climate change is one of them. We're really clear. We are all personally collecting that data. Like, you know, if you're from California, you know what's up. The whole state's been on fire for like a couple of years straight now. We're about to like go into, like now you get a couple of the non-fire months and then you have fire months and that's most of the year, right? Um, so one of the things 
one of the aspects of this and, and writing about this is the, the delicacy of being honest with people about what science is and what the process of science is without undercutting people's confidence in these important pieces of information that we do have that we need people to accept so that we can address real policy, real life, real world problems, right? Um, at the same time, you know, one of the things that we benefit from in particle physics is that pretty much nothing that um, we're working on right now is a matter of life and death. Mm. I say pretty much because, you know, medical physics is actually basically uh, something that lives at the intersection of like nuclear physics and health science and particle physics. So there is a small sliver of what we do that actually can make an impact on like everyday life and death. Um, if you've had an MRI, thank nuclear physics researchers. Mm -hmm. um, if you've, if you've had CT scans, um, if you go to the dentist now and they can just like use like a little X-ray gun on your teeth, um, and it's not this big drama of, is everybody going to get radiated? Thank medical physicists. That's all, um, and engineers, nuclear engineers. That's all work that, that those folks are doing. Um, but for the most part, what we do is a step back from physical life and death. It's maybe more in the realm of existential life and death. Like, how does this, this make us feel? Um, and so there, I think it's okay to be comfortable with the fact that like, there's a lot of confusing stuff going on. These are hard questions. And it is also the case that again, coming back to those tropes about what science writing voice is supposed to sound like, that you pick up these books about particle physics that have been written by generally speaking white men. And they tell you these things about the universe as if they are known to be true. So I'm not going to name names, but for example, there's one person who likes to write about string theory as if it is like factual and known. We still have like no compelling evidence that string theory is the correct theory of quantum gravity compared to other theories of quantum gravity. And so I was making a conscious decision to not write in that mode. I think that that's an important thing to say. Great. Nice. Thank you. Um, I think in thinking about um, who gets privilege of, of getting to ask the questions? I think you kind of touched on that a little bit. Whose model of inquiry, um, what is respected? And that really resonated with me um, when I read your piece on um, Mauna Kea, and I hope, I hope I'm saying that correctly, um, how much of what we know about astronomy and cosmology are due to a large number of telescopes having been built on, on Mauna Kea. Can you, um, I guess I want to ask you, what is it that we lose when we only view astronomy and or cosmology from a Eurocentric perspective and we neglect to take into consideration the histories and the knowledge of indigenous perspectives as it relates to these areas? So I think going back even to, to what I was just talking about in terms of like, what are our motivations and our interests, right? Um, why do we want to know about the night sky? Why are we looking up at the night sky? Why are we asking these questions? Why are we putting so much time into pursuing answers to these questions? And there are different sets of answers. So there's the very practical answer, which is that often the, the technologies that we develop in order to pursue these questions become useful both to industry and to the military. Um, and then also sometimes the process of refining these techniques involves taking military technologies and refining them. And um, so there are some good examples of, uh, of this on Mauna Kea, actually, that, for example, like laser technologies that the military developed and then got refined using telescopes on Mauna Kea and Haleakala. And then that information gets passed back to the military and gets used for other purposes. So that's one reason. And that's probably, if we're being honest with ourselves, a major reason that today money comes in the direction of astronomy. Um, at the same time, long before you know, we had capitalist establishment, long before the United States existed, long before colonialism as we understand it in a contemporary sense was happening, people were looking up at the sky and telling stories and finding patterns and finding information. Um, and that's true across every single culture. 
And that indicates that there's also an element of doing this that actually goes back to um, what Sylvia Winter calls homo nerens, that we are not just a biological species, we are a biocultural species. And um, so for folks who don't know Sylvia Winter, she's a black woman, a philosopher, I would say theorist of science, theorist of literature. She's, I, I don't know, she's a genius. Let's just put it there. Um, and she really forcefully makes the point that we are not just biological, that we are storytellers. And so I actually see that this work that we do of looking up at the sky as a very deeply human activity. And so then when we think about what perspectives matter in engaging in this very deeply human activity, it can't just be one cultural context. The other cultural contexts have to be part of the conversation. And if it is the case that we want to move past um, you know, military industrial complex motivations for doing the work that we do, then what we come back to is the humanist impulse for why we do this work. And if we're thinking about it through a humanist framing, then the idea that we do it by any means necessary, sacrificing culture, sacrificing identity, sacrificing good relations between people no longer makes any sense. Yeah, I, I, um, I'm gonna stick on this just for a little bit because I was thinking about um, how in the book you talked about um, when this initially came up for you, you turned down an opportunity to, to go there. Can you just talk a little bit about that? I, I, just, I just thought that that was just um, amazing. So I just wanted to hear a little bit about what your process was in, in, in thinking about that and making that decision. Yeah, I realize I should contextualize even these questions about Mauna Kea for, for people to, to better understand them. So thank you for the, the follow-up. Um, so Mauna Kea is uh, one of the best places in the world to see the night sky. It's at a high altitude, it's in Hawaii. Um, and uh, being at a high altitude means that it's above some of the layers of atmosphere that get in between us and looking at what's outside of Earth. And so that's like a really obvious reason why you might want to put a telescope there just to kind of make the like, these are the physical properties of the environment. It is also a place that has long been considered um, a sacred place in Hawaii by Kanaka Maoli and um, native Hawaiian people. Um, and so it's actually Mauna Alakea. So it's actually the place where um, the earth meets the, the father sky god, Wakea. So this is a very important place. It is also a place that has at points been used as a burial ground, um, but not with the you know, Christian style markers. Um, and so there is this feeling of like, it's a terra nullis, I think um, from the point of view of um, people who colonized Hawaii, it's a terra nullis, there's nothing here. We can do what we want with it. Importantly, the land is also generally speaking considered to be unceded indigenous land. Like this is not land that was handed over, this is land that was taken by the United States. So that's the context for, for, for this discussion. When I was, um, I was starting my junior year of, of, of college, I was offered an opportunity to take a year off and go spend a year working as a staffer at a new telescope on Mauna Kea. And it was a job that would have paid, I think at the time it was like $50,000, which was like, to me at the time, like a million bucks. My mom raised me on half of that. And so just like the thought of that amount of money, right? Um, and it's also the kind of opportunity that if you do something like that, it can write your ticket. Um, you do something like that and you get into any graduate program you want, even if your GPA is kind of so-so, which mine was. Um, and so this was like, in many ways, this was my chance. And I was like all hype about doing it. And then I looked up, I, I, I looked up Mauna Kea on Yahoo because this was pre-Google days. And um, I saw that there was a picket line outside of the, the telescope. And I come from a labor family. I spent time on picket lines as a kid. Um, and in fact, that was, um, we had just wrapped up 
um, the living wage campaign sit in at Harvard, where I was an active um, leader in the tent city. And I was one of the people who had first proposed that we have a sit in and take over the president's office. So I was like, labor organizing is in my blood, it's in my brain, it's part of my value system. So I wrote to the guy and said, I can't cross a picket line. And that was that. And that was in um, fall of, it was either fall of 2001 or spring of 2002. Wow. So it was well before like any discussion about Mauna Kea really took off in the public imagination and conversation. Great. Thank you so much for sharing that, that backstory with us. Um, so in reading your references to um, the history of Thomas Jefferson, Sally Hemmings, and white supremacy, um, I was thinking about how currently we have people who want to change the narrative, right, about history not teach the history of slavery. And I'm thinking about folks who are opposed to like the 1619 Project being taught in schools, et cetera. So I'm, I'm thinking about women like Dr. Hannah Jones, Naomi Osaka, Jamil Hill, how these women have experienced this, this form of silencing of their voices in this country. And was wondering, how do you think movements like me too, and I know this is a broad question, but me too, Black Lives Matter, how do those types of movements help to highlight these attempts to, in some ways, disempower Black women's voices? And, and have you experienced this in your own academic professional career, this, this attempt to silence or disempower your voice? So something that we in the academy have seen a lot of over the last few years is, um, organizations that are highly funded by billionaires, conservative billionaires like the, the Koch family. Mm -hmm. um, I, and the specific one I'm thinking of is campus reform that will, um, that basically trains students at universities to become um, narcs and to seek out what they can, who they consider to be left-leaning professors and find things on social media and take them out of context. Um, or record people in classrooms and take those recordings out of context. And basically the site functions as a feeder for places like Fox News and, and other things. And, and we've seen people have gotten fired um, because of reports that basically start on this website. Um, for several years, people were sounding the alarm about this, this site. And in fact, in the early days, uh, they were testing out these techniques specifically on black women. And um, a recent study by the American Association of University Professors finds that um, black people are disproportionately targeted by the site, black academics. So um, I was one of the, the black women who was targeted in um, like basically three in a row um, uh, in 2015. And once something like that happens to you, it completely changes your life. Um, you have to have home security. Um, I was given guidance about how to walk down the street safely. I can't wear headphones in public anymore. Um, there are all of these like these these little things. Um, I get hate mail. I get death threats. Um, it's it's a conversation that I had to have with academic institutions that were were um, making me job offers. Um, people get people who work with me get emails about me. Um, get. Um, request to fire me, request to sit in my classroom to make sure that I'm not indoctrinating the children. I remember, I, I think like my favorite one, I'm laughing about this, but like my favorite one was somebody called my department chair and said like, I need you to make sure that she's not teaching the stuff in the classroom. And I had to write to my department chair and be like, yeah, we have actually haven't had much occasion to talk about like the history and origins of American anti-Semitism in my stellar astrophysics class, right? <laughs> I'm, so that, that, that's like a real thing that that's happening. Mm -hmm. And the same people are running around screaming about how free speech is under threat from what they're calling in big air quotes, critical race theory, because they don't know what critical race theory even yeah. is or what it means. But they're like critical race theory is threatening free speech. And I'm like, you guys are literally trying to pass laws so that we can't talk about critical race theory. So now tomorrow, Juneteenth is going to become a federal holiday and there are going to be places where teachers can get in trouble for talking about what Juneteenth even is, right? Like, so 
you know, when we talk about who respects America and who respects like the documents of America, I have real questions about people who are passing laws or trying to pass laws that restrict free speech, telling me that they're pro-America. Like, yes and no. Uh, there was a great, like, if anybody's ever seen Mean Girls, there was a great meme that was circulating yesterday that was like, so you agree that racism is a, a, a basic tenet of the United States, right? Like, they're actually committing to that statement by, by making these claims. And even meanwhile, I'm sitting here thinking, okay, this video right now is going to be made public. How is this going to be cut? Yeah, right? Exactly. Um, so I do think that there's there's that side of it, which is that we really live under threat. We really live under fear. Um, those death threats are no joke. Mm -hmm. um, and you know, few, very few of us are like rich people who can hire bodyguards. Like I can't afford that, right? So like we're generally speaking on our own with it too. Um, it's like us and campus police, which like involving campus police is fraught for, for a variety of reasons. The one thing I want to say about this critical race theory debate is I think it's a little bit of a cultural self-own by um, the people like losing, like just screaming about critical race theory. Um, thanks to them, everybody's talking about critical race exactly. theory and what it is. <laughs> CNN had a beautiful explainer of what critical race theory is um, posted on their website. The Washington Post has journalists writing about here's what critical race theory actually is. As someone who uses critical race theory in my Black feminist science, technology, and society studies work, thank you <laughs> for making sure that people are actually talking about critical race theory. And I love the fact that, like, you know, people are talking about what's the difference between critical race theory, critical social theory, critical theory. What is Theodoro Adorno's uh, relationship to Kimberly Crenshaw's intersectionality? Let's get that clear. We're getting that clear in public now. And in that sense, they have accidentally democratized what was previously kind of an ivory tower conversation. So it's a little bit of a cell phone. They may be winning at the legislatures right now, but I think the truth is, is that they're losing in the public conversation. Yeah, I, and I would agree. And um, just want to say, I'm just sorry that you have to deal with that targeted crazy mess that's that's scary on a lot of levels and I have a cousin named Ray Ray who's 400 <laughs> <laughs> I, just, I have to say there's I don't know if people have been watching that Michael Che on HBO Max he has he has like a sketch show and in the last episode he has like the sketch about a homegirl app where like you don't want to be a snitch who calls the cops so you just pull out your homegirl app and a homegirl will sh show up and take care of business and in the middle of it he, they have the, him splice talking about things in his family and his community. He's like, every family has a woman yeah. who you can call. And I turned to my spouse and I looked at him and I was like, I think I am that person in my family. <laughs> yeah. I think my mother and I multi-generationally are the people that folks are like, someone needs to take care of this. Yeah. You have to have those, those family members that's going to handle the business that you don't want to. Yeah. I, I, I'm resonating with that. So um, thank you. Um, I, I really um, appreciated how you highlighted the contributions of women throughout your entire book. Shaniqua Gay, the artist Willie Hobbs Moore, the first African American. That's Shaniqua Gay's painting right behind me. I, I just say that. love that. I, I, at, at some point, you have to get Shanae to show you her piece of art. It's fabulous. So um, anyway, I, I was also thinking simultaneously about those women that have sort of been left out or ignored. So Wu Jin Shong and, and Jocelyn Del Bernal. Um, but you did a you talked about your recollection of how Dr. Vera Rubin simply asked you what was your opinion about solving one of the biggest problems in physics and I wanted to ask you, why was that moment, you, you termed what she did in that asking as anti-establishment. Can you speak a little bit more about that? Why, why it sound, the way I read it, it sounded like a very profound moment for you, but I don't wanna put that on you. I just wanted to hear about what, what did that mean for you? You know, in some sense, I think 
I, I was listening to a podcast episode yesterday, which I wish I could remember the name of the podcast with Alexis Pauline Gums, who I want to um, point people to her work as, as, as a black woman, who's also, um, thinking about science and, um, she has, a uh, this beautiful book out, which I'm going to look at it undrowned. That's the name of the title. It's right back there. Um, about marine animals. And she had this episode that she did of this podcast about remembering. And I think that this is one of those moments where the practice of remembering is like a very interesting one, because I think there's the experience that I had in the moment. And then there's the experience that I've had with that memory since then. And in some sense, the, it has become more profound with time. So to, to give people um, just a summary of that moment, she asked me, I was introduced to Vera Rubin at the 2009 Women in Astronomy Conference. And I wanna say this is, the story is exemplary of why conferences that focus on um, women and non-binary people and people who are marginalized genders are actually really important is for people to have these connections. She was introduced to me and very quickly said, so what do you think of solving the dark matter problem? And the significance of this is that Vera Rubin is the astronomer who along with Kent Ford, I found the first significant evidence for the existence of dark matter. So I, as a graduate student, was like, well, shit, I don't have a good answer to this question. <laughs> that was really, I know that that's like, that's what happened in my head. Um, and the reason that I didn't have a good answer for this question was in part because physics is very hierarchical. And there are some questions that you're considered to be like the right kind of person to think about. And I did not see myself, I had been socialized not to see myself as someone who could think about that question and whose opinion about it would matter. Even if I was working on dark matter, there still would have been this feeling of, I'm just a graduate student. My opinion about, about these big questions is not, Vera Rubin shouldn't be asking me that question. Mm -hmm. I'm in, and that's why I say like the practice of remembering becomes really important here because as I've gotten older and my position has changed and I'm now training students, um, that, sh that, that moment shapes for me, what is the power I have, my, shapes my understanding and thinking about what is the power I have in that situation. Um, the, you can say like, you can ask a one question that can plant a seed with someone. And that's really important. Um, and, and sometimes, you know, it wasn't that I immediately went off and worked on dark matter. I didn't start working on it for another five years, but I think that also she laid the ground that when I was given the opportunity, I think I second guessed myself and whether I belonged in the room trying to answer it less. Yeah, that's a good, that's, that's great. Yeah, to, to have somebody who, uh, of her stature to just sort of encourage and support you is I think so important. Um, yeah. I Can I, can I just add one, one yeah. little addendum to that, which is a piece of the story that I don't think I tell in the book, but it's going to appear in a Scientific American feature on dark matter sometime, maybe in the September issue, is that the other piece of my experience with, with Vera is that she then said, let's sit down to lunch so I, I sat down at lunch with her and she saw another like old white lady <laughs> when we walked into the lunchroom and went, do you all know who this is? This is Nancy Grace Roman. <laughs> and um, people in the astronomy community will know Nancy Grace Roman as um, she was known as the mother of the Hubble telescope. She is oh, the wow. NASA administrator who basically made sure that Hubble happened as a project and actually got launched and took off and became this incredible piece of our, our public imagination. So much so that when a piece of it stopped working this week, we everybody is kind of feeling like, oh God, we need Hubble, right? So I think the important thing was also seeing Vera be kind of a fangirl. <laughs> <laughs> I just kind of want to like say like, and, and then, you know, sitting and watching the two of them have conversation. I have no recollection of what they said, but just like the idea of watching her honor someone who was a little bit her elder too, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think was a really important experience of seeing, and, and Nancy Grace Roman was not an astronomer, right? So also seeing this recognition of an administrator as, as, as really important. Yeah. 
that that's just really cool that she uh, just ver gave you that access and that opportunity. That's that's really cool. Um, you you indicate in your Black People Are Luminous Matter chapter that you talk about how Black women are expected to be infinitely competent, uh, no matter the psych psychological, physical, or social costs. And I can personally resonate with that observation. How do you how do you negotiate this expectation in your own profession? Um, like, and what steps do you take to self caretake yourself when you see instances of this happening in your own life, these sort of expectations of what you should do or who you should be? How do you take care of yourself? I hate these questions because then I have to be honest. Be and I realize this. <laughs> I realize actually I, I should clarify something I said in my last question. At the time, like the most significant impact that Nancy Grace Ehrman had was when she was acting as an administrator, but she was actually initially an astronomer. Um, but whew, I watch a lot of reality TV. <laughs> And actually, I will say that like I follow trends in that like I check out like what are what are um, black folks talking about on social media. And I'm more likely to pick up a reality show if I see a lot of folks talking about it because I kind of want to be in on those conversations. Um, and so I picked up RHOA because a bunch of my friends were watching it. So that's Real Housewives of Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> for, for people who don't know. Guilty. Guilty. Yes. Um, I. So that, that's one of the things I find that reality TV like causes me to, um, I don't know, it gets me out of my head in a way, which like, I don't know, probably listening to me talk, you can tell I spend a lot of time in it. And so I think like reality television is really important. Um, I, I, I work with my spouse as, as a partnership with, with what I'm doing and I'm, um, that means that, you know, when I'm agreeing to events, even that's a conversation that we are having with each other. I am, and that might seem like, okay, well, that's not about you. That's maybe about like caring for your spouse, but that, you know, taking care of my relationship with my spouse is part of, um, you know, making sure that like my house is in order, literally, right? Um, with and, and the same thing, I, I put in the work to maintain my relationships with my beloveds in my life. And I think that, that is, that's a really important aspect of it. I will say that in a lot of ways, I think I'm probably not like a good role model on this front. Um, because the particular choices that I've made, the commitments that I've made involve doing a lot of work. Um, and in a lot of ways, I'm okay with that. There are certain things that I wish I didn't have to deal with. Like, I'm, you know, when we talk about under-resourcing under universities and under-resourcing academics, I'm, when I was at Harvard as an undergraduate, all of the professors had an administrative assistant who helped them with paperwork and stuff like that. I don't have anything like that. I don't want to knock our administrators at UNH Physics because they like bust ass, but I'm, they can't do those things for me. And so I'm when we talk about like under-resourcing public institutions, a lot of what's happened, and I'm sure you've experienced this in your own way, is that a lot of work that was devalued as like, we don't need to pay someone to do this. Um, we are now being asked to do it. And we don't, we don't know about like actually filling out, people make it seem like filling out paperwork is simple and everybody just knows how to do it, but they're often like subtleties and mm -hmm. knowing which form and, and all of that. Um, so I will just say that one of the ways that like self-care can actually be made difficult is that in taking any of these things on, I'm also taking on the administrative burden that I'm um, a generation or two generations before me, um, a white man would have had someone to relieve that burden, possibly in the form of like a stay-at-home partner who was taking care of everything, but also probably what would have been called at the time a secretary. And I don't live in that world. Um, so that I think that's one of the challenges that I face in terms of self-care is that um, it's not just me getting to do the work, but I have to do all of the work to make doing the work possible. Thank you. Um, I'm just gonna take a moment to remind folks to please throw your great questions in the chat so we can get to those in a, in a few minutes. Great, thank you. 
Um, can you can you talk a little bit about this? So one of the things when when I get into sort of uh, topics that I'm not so familiar with, and, and Chanae and I were talking about this. Now I see everything as it relates to like quarks and, and quantum this and that. It just catches my eye. And I came across um, this conversation about this new discovery by Alexia Lopez, um, this doctoral candidate in cosmology at the University of Central Lancashire. Are you familiar with that? And just was wondering why, why is this discovery important? And, and what are some of the things we can we can learn learn from it? So I'll say you just asked me a question about the one thing where I can be classed as a conservative. Okay. Um, which is I'm all for like this is a tantalizing hint. Let's see what happens next. Mm -hmm. um, but I need a lot of data before you try and convince me that our model isn't working correctly. Um, so. I'm interested in, in the results from, from Desi. And I'm, and I should say that the analysis was, was led by one person, but a lot of people's work went into that data collection. Um, and, and I should say that like, there's you know, a real tension there between like individual credit and recognizing that nobody does these things by themselves. Um, so that's not to undercut like the individual contributions, but to say that there are a lot of other people involved too. Um, yeah, so my my take on that story is like probably not very exciting, which is like, okay, find me another one. Find me find me more evidence that this isn't um so first of all, I want a second team to analyze the results and see if they come to the same conclusion. Very nice. That's like step one is it has to be a reproducible result that is verifiable by an independent team. Um and then, and then the next thing is, is like, okay, does this really indicate that our models are wrong or is there some Gaussian distribution where things are typically like this, but occasionally you're going to find things in the tail that are a little bit different. Um, one of the tensions that I have around doing science communication is that for reasons that I think are pretty obvious, the science media really likes to be like, thing. Maybe everything's broken, revolution in science. Mm -hmm. And it's pretty much like that every week. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, that's good. But science, but science is like more slow going than that, which mm -hmm. is that like, you know, people are putting out papers, they're claiming a thing. Like at some point, um, while I was a postdoc at MIT, they were like, yeah, faster than speed of light neutrinos. And then it turned out actually a cable wasn't plugged in properly. Literally, cable was not plugged in properly, right? Tantalizing result. Also, let's check it out first. Mm -hmm. So I, I think right now that's my attitude about it. <laughs> I tend to be very conservative about I need data. Like when I so when I say I'm a born empiricist, I'm like, I need data. Yeah. You 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 definitely you sound like a librarian. We're just all about, we're all about the site resources, data, where, where'd you get that from? Yeah. So yeah, I, I definitely understand that. Um so I, I'm just curious, um, just in terms of observatories, how many have you visited? And I, you don't have to give me an exact number, but do you have any that are your favorite or that you haven't visited, but you would like to? So I've actually only been to two professional facilities. Okay. Um, I guess unless we count like the little ones on the roof of the 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 Center for Astrophysics, Harvard Smithsonian, mm -hmm. um, but those are largely used by students at this point, um, or for like you know taking the public up to see a telescope. They were at one point used for actual research. Um, so I have been down to the Magellan Observatory uh, in Las Campanas in the Atacama Desert in Chile, which I write about in the book. Yes. And so there, there are twin 6.5 meter telescopes there where I spent 10 days. And that was an incredible life-changing experience as I talk about in the book, because that was my first time really realizing what the night sky would have looked like to my ancestors and how much people were missing out on because of light pollution. Um, because a lot of people didn't have access to a dark night sky. 
I have also been to an Air Force telescope on Haleakala in Hawaii. And I'm there I wasn't working like I was in Las Campanas. I was just there as, as part of a tour um, with graduate students from UC Santa Cruz um, when I was in the, the PhD program there in astronomy before I left. Um, that was a very interesting experience <laughs> because they showed us that the telescope could move like literally like that, like really this quickly. And it was because they were using it to track missiles over the Pacific. That was like one of the ways, yeah. And, and I should say that this is also, there are also protests about, about Haleakala. Um, yeah, I, I have to say like my time at the Magellan Observatory was, was, was really magical. And it was also physically grueling because you have to flip your schedule and try and sleep until two o'clock in the afternoon and then get up and stay up until the sun comes up the next day. That is grueling. That, that's yes. very grueling. I came away from it very impressed with observational astronomers because what <laughs> they do is actually just hard. Like there are things where you have to capture like a background image at exactly the right moment or it's hard to calibrate your data. All of these things that are really hard. And I'm like, yeah, I'm a theorist. I can do things kind of more leisurely, mm -hmm. less time pressure, less physically grueling. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've got a couple questions, and I know we're kind of coming up on the hour. We don't we want to release you when we're supposed to. Um, a question that we got in the chat, could you talk a bit more about writing a science book, and especially a book about experimental physics for Black people, and specifically, um, let's see, Black women, trans, and non-binary people, and Indigenous, and especially Two-Spirit LGBT Native people? So there's more commentary, but I just wanted to put the question out there. I'm, yeah, so I'm actually, I'm looking at the rest of the question. I think in some sense, my answer is gonna be related to, to the rest of it, which is like, mm -hmm. I often encounter this dynamic where programming funding to encourage marginalized people to go into STEM fields. is very going to applied STEM fields or do research on inequity in STEM education um, with less to no support for marginalized people to go into abstract, theoretical fields. Um, so I just want to validate Jackson that that's like a, that's like a real phenomenon that's happening, um, which is, yeah, learn to code. Google will throw tons of money at black girls code. I have not seen them throw any money at efforts to increase like the number of black women in theoretical and theoretical particle physics, for example, right? Um, so I think that this is a real issue. And I think a lot of it comes back to articulating Black people, Indigenous people, people from underrepresented groups as a source for the workforce, um, as a labored source. And I just want to remind people that articulating Black folks' primary value as a labor force is actually really troubling. Um, so I think that that's, I, I think in some sense, part of my goal with the book was actually to, to challenge that. Great. Can, can you see the questions, uh, Dr. Yes, Pearson? I can see the questions. So I'll, I'll let you go through them um, until we're, we're done. So. Um, so I see a question from Corey Gray, who I want to highlight because um, he is Blackfoot, he's a physicist, and he works on the LIGO gravitational wave experiment. And you can also find him on Twitter. Corey, maybe you'd be willing to put your Twitter handle in the chat so that people know who you are. Um, so Corey asked me a question. Uh, you mentioned a connection with Lakota people. Did you get to hear any of their astronomy star stories? Um, so because Corey asked me this question, I'm going to answer it. If Corey, if it had been someone else, I, I might not. Um, my mother was welcomed by Lakota folks who lived in Los Angeles into Lakota community. And so as a child, I went to the Sundance I, a couple of times. So I don't mean the film festival, I mean the actual um, <laughs> Sundance, and which whose name has unfortunately been appropriated by a film festival. And so I did see and hear a lot of things. I will say that generally speaking, I don't share that publicly because it's not my, my place to share what, what I was offered. Um, but I will say that so much of the perspective that is in the book is shaped by the time that I spent with Lakota folks and with other people from different indigenous communities. Um, but that is necessarily like the spirit of that experience, I think, is in the book for me, because it was probably my most significant um, spiritual influence as a child. 
much more so really in many ways than um, Jewish spirituality. So I'll just, I'll say, and Corey, I'm happy to answer questions for you directly about it, but I did want to address that. Thanks, Corey, for the question. Um, Shanae, did you, where are we in terms of time? We are right at time, so I'll bring us on home. If you haven't read The Disordered Cosmos, we hope that this incredible talk inspires you to go and buy a copy for yourself and other inquisitive stargazers and cosmological dreamers in your life. Uh, visit Dr. Prescott Weinstein's work. We'll drop the link in the chat and keep in touch with her. I want to thank you, Dr. Dr. I just like, oh my gosh, like having a woman with a puff. And we we name dropped Ray Ray and Real Housewives of Atlanta. That's never been never been done at a DPLA event. And I just appreciate the lack of code switching and you all bringing your full self to this talk and really sharing how science problems are indicative of the problems in the rest of our society. Um, I particularly resonated with the pop culture references throughout the book. So it was awesome to hear today your take on the critical race theory debates and cancel culture and other uh, current events. And thank you, Lori, so much for asking such thoughtful questions. I feel like this was a match made in the, in the heavens. Yeah, I just want to say thank you, Lori, for the questions. I'm sorry that we didn't get to the question about music and songs, but I'm going to answer the, the, the question. Um, I just want to recommend everybody check out Eve's Tumor's new song, Jackie, that just came out on Tuesday. It's so good. Um, so thank you so much, Lori. Thank you so much, Shani. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. This has been incredible.